Today is September the 15th, 2017. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University, and today I'm in Stillwater Public Library to speak with Marilyn Stewart. And this is part of our Spotlight in Oklahoma project focused on monarchs here in Oklahoma. So thank you for having, having me today or coming today. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> and did I get that right? It's Stewart. 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 Yes, with Stewart. a T. Uh -huh. With a T. Okay. Uh, let's begin with having you tell us when and where you were born. I was born in 1954 in Oklahoma City. Okay. And what did your parents do for a living? My mother was a stay-at-home mom. My dad was a letter carrier oh. and a wedding photographer. That's an interesting combination. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> rural, rural letter carrier? No, in, in city, town? city letter carrier, yes. Yeah. So we'd have to walk? Yes. Very good shape. <laughs> <laughs> and did you have siblings? I had two older sisters. And yeah. you the baby? Yeah. Obviously. And where did you go to elementary school? At Buchanan Elementary School. Okay. Grades one through? One through six, and then went on to Taft Junior High, and then North was class in high school, and then Oklahoma State. Okay, good. So when did you graduate from high school? Uh, 1972. 72. And did you have a favorite subject? Um, probably art. Okay. And was it just assumed you would go to college? Yes, there was no question. <laughs> Neither one of my parents or grandparents at all, none of them had gone to college, but it was, nobody questioned it, you were going to college. And did you have a choice in where you could go? Oh yeah, just go wherever we wanted to go. But. But it wasn't negotiable. You were going to college. <laughs> <laughs> and so you picked OSU? Picked OSU. Okay. Yes, went to OSU for three years and then graduated from the University of Texas at Dallas. Well, while you were at Oklahoma State, what did you major in? Uh, English and art history. Okay. Uh, do you remember? I also did a minor in black studies. Black studies? Uh -huh. Yeah. Did African American studies, uh -huh. yeah. A good combo, I guess. It was an odd combo. But. <laughs> uh, remember any professors? Um, any professors? Yes, but now that I'm on the spot, I can't remember their names. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> and the reason you switched schools? Got married, moved to Dallas area, okay. and then got my degree there. And finished in 1970. If it was seven. Four. I think 77, yeah. Okay. And wh while you were at OSU, did you live on campus? Yes. And which in Willard. Willard? Yes. Yeah. It's not a dorm anymore. It's not a dorm anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a cool place to live in. Close to the uh, Theta Close Pond. Close to Theta Pond. And, yeah. and to the library. Yeah. 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 And what floor were you on? First floor, room 151. And you remember that? I always remember that. <laughs> and was that your roommate someone you knew? Uh, no. Well, for one year it was, but the other years just did potluck, which was interesting. Yeah. Did you do any uh, like campus activities like beyond the board of ward or mm, organizations? Or I was like on that? the food committee for like the campus area wide food committee that worked with the um, food services and stuff. Follow any of the sports? Oh, just, you know, any other? to go on a date. Yeah, football, basketball, wrestling. Wrestling was always good. So. Okay. And I always have to ask, did you spend any time in the library? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> many, many hours in the library. Did you have a favorite spot? I loved whenever you walked up the stairs on the right-hand side, that big room with the high windows. Okay. It's still there. Uh, and there was one room at the very top that had kind of a fan window. I'd love to sit in front of that and read. And that's on the fourth floor, so mm -hmm. you can still do that too. Good. Still, that's <laughs> I might do that later on today. <laughs> <laughs> you can look out over the former gardens from there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you had two sisters. Mm -hmm. Did that either one of them go to OSU? One did. One graduated from OSU. Okay. So you followed, well, she may say you followed her. Sort of. <laughs> Okay, and once you graduated from Texas, what happened to take us through? Um, had children. Did I've done hand painted like back splashes, tile work. Um, I also became certified in sign language interpretation, and then. But my love has always been gardening, so 
I, I worked for a, a nursery for a while there in Seminole. And then when life changes, you change, and I, I opened my own nursery. Well, that was a, a uh, challenge or not so much? To start a nursery? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't know where to begin. <clears throat> uh, I knew what I wanted to do, and I felt passionate about it, so I did it. Do you have a greenhouse, too? have a greenhouse that's only in use about three months out of the year, four months out of the year. So I try to move things out as fast as I can, because I'm just growing native plants, mostly. Okay. And about how much acreage does it take to do that sort of thing? Uh, well, I, I utilize my deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, since, we, um, since we're a traveling nursery, so okay. we don't sell on site. We just put everything in the cars and we go to shows like the Audubon Show and um, the Sand Springs Herbalist Fair, Jinx Herb Show, Oakland Sea Garden Fest, things like that. So you have to hope things are blooming at the right time? or You know, people who are interested in native plants and people who are passionate about butterflies and birds, they don't care what it looks like. That's awesome. So very rarely are my things blooming. They're just looking for the plant. Because this tends to be a fairly, I hate to say the word educated, a knowledgeable group of what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. It's a very specialized nursery. You have to be able to talk the talk. Yeah, I mean, they, they know what they're looking for and mm -hmm. what butterflies they're trying to attract, and what the larval host plant is. And, and there's been a huge shift since I started this. Our first year of business was uh, 2002 and the change in in how many people are interested in this kind of plant has just been incredible you know because at first you know the people oh that's something you'd see by the side of the road and now it's like this is what I want so there's been a real shift in perception of what a landscape should look like in my opinion um, and people are wanting more and more to go for things that are beneficial to wildlife and, and stuff. So. Well, that's, that's a good thing. It yeah, it's helpful. <laughs> it's helpful. <laughs> well, when you first started, what was your primary uh, thing that you sold? What was the main thing that you would, you would keep milk going? Milkweeds. Probably always milkweeds. Always weeds. milkweed. Yeah, people always wanted milkweeds. Um, and I find that if you are really passionate about a particular plant, you can sell it, you know, if you really believe in something, you know, and, and one of the nice things about the business we have is that we, you know, go out to these shows and you really get to talk to people and, you know, kind of walk them through and, you know, what do you, you know, how much sun do you have, what are you trying to do, are you a control freak, you know, and try to kind of match what they're looking for with what plants I have. Well, it takes a, a, quite a bit of knowledge to be able to figure all that out, I would think. Um, I, would think. You know? <laughs> I don't know, you just kind of figure it out the way. Well, there's different types of milkweed, though. It's not just yeah. one Yeah, one that's thing. true. That's true. And some, to me, the native milkweeds are much harder to grow and become established. I, I just don't find... Milkweeds that are the native perennial types, they grow where they want to grow. And if you put them in the wrong spot, they're just not going to grow there. They're not going to flourish. And so people become very frustrated and I think discouraged with it, that they can't get milkweeds to grow the way they want them to grow. Kind of in Oklahoma, they need to be drought resistant, it seems. Some of them do. Some of them like more, more moisture. And so the tropical comes in handy, especially for somebody who's, who's wanting to feed monarchs don't really know what they're doing, it's a good way to get them started, for sure. Okay. And then what other types of milkweed do you sell? I do tuberosa, incarnata, speciosa, uh, syriaca, and if I pronounce things wrong, I'm sorry, that's just, <laughs> um, but my very, the, one of my favorite ones to promote, besides the tropical, is the blue vine, which is Sinanchon levy. And in my opinion, and this is based on no research at all, just a gut feeling, this is why we still have monarchs today, is because of that thing. Is it actually a vine? It's a vine. 
and sometimes people will call it that blankety blank line because it will take over. Um, but in Oklahoma in particular, um, you know, when you look at the map of, of the monarchs coming back down towards Mexico, it's like a funnel going down into Mexico. And so we're kind of at the bottom of that, you know, where it's going in on that funnel. And the monarchs are laying their eggs, and they need something to lay their eggs on. Well, the tuberosa has generally gone dormant by then. The viridis has gone dormant. Um, all these other ones have gone dormant. You might have incarnata. The tropical milkweed will still be blooming some, if, you know, will still be viable and crunchy and stuff if people are, you know, growing it. But as far as our natives, the incarnata is just about the only one that still has soft leaves on it. The other ones have all gone dormant, especially if we've had a hard summer. But this blue vine is just phenomenal. And I guarantee you, I could walk out of this room right here. We could go outside and we could walk around the building or around the next block and we could find some. Interesting. Uh, I've probably seen it then and just you don't probably know. It. it doesn't look like any other milkweed because it's got opposite leaves. It almost looks like a morning glory leaf. Um, they're opposite, and um, it's, it's, it's everywhere. You'll find it growing through bushes. Um, I find it a lot, like on chain link fences, especially in downtown areas, old downtown areas. Um, find it in areas that the master gardeners were going to take care of that spot, and they had high hopes in the spring, and then everybody went on vacation, and water was too hard to get by, and so they ignored the beds in the downtown area, and now the blue vine's taken over. So you'll find it in those kind of places. Well, and how does it get started? Just seeds. I mean, seeds. but it has underground runners and it can just go everywhere. But that is the life-saving plant, in my opinion. What kind of bloom does it have? A little white, kind of little cluster of blooms, not real big. Okay. Yeah, but it has that, that um, iconic milkweed pod looking thing on it. Okay. And then uh, someone had mentioned swamp, swamp? Swamp milkweed, uh, incarnata. Swamp milkweed, and it kind of it's kind of misnamed a little bit. It doesn't have to have swampy uh, conditions. It just likes more of a garden type setting. So it, it's a good one to grow in the garden. Well, when you're taking these from festival to festival, you have a, a minivan or a <laughs> yes, how do you do? It's amazing how much you can fit into a minivan. Yeah, so we have a minivan. Then my husband has a Prius, and it's amazing what you can get in there. <laughs> and do you usually sell out? Yeah, or, well, we, yeah on some shows we just about to. Yeah. If it's milkweed, we definitely sell out the milkweed. Wow, and then how do you get more, on your end, how do you get more? You grow it from seed Maybe. and stuff. Yeah, I just try to anticipate, which is always hard to do. Predicting and judging, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About how many do you go to in a, in a season? We usually go eight to ten shows in the spring. Mm -hmm. We usually try to do a couple of shows in the fall if they're available. And then in the meantime, you're nursing what you have? Nursing what I have, yeah. 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 Oh. And you started in 2002, so it's plugging right along. It's plugging right along, yeah. And yeah. It's, it's definitely in a niche market, but it's been tons of fun. We have met some of the coolest people. Yeah. And do you trade seeds with other people? Uh -huh. That's one of the nice things, too, that I like about it, because you know, you'd think that everybody would be real, you know, no, you're not going to have my stuff. <laughs> but I have other growers that we trade seeds with and plants with. And, you know, I'm, we can call each other up and say, I can't seem to get this germinated or I can't seem to get this grow. And we help each other out, which is really, it's, it's really possible. Well, does someone have to be watching, you know, over the course of the, of the season or do you, can you go on vacation and come no, back? Not in the spring, season? we can't. That's <laughs> no. Yeah, so no. Say you couldn't uh -huh. pretty much tie. Yeah, from December uh -huh. on until June, there's no, we're there. So. And you do water? You have to water most of it? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Or, yeah. I mean, when seed, when it's, once a seed sprouts and it's on a heat mat, you really got to watch it close. So you get up each morning thinking, okay, let's go see what's what's still, oh, it's fun. What's still green or what, what's poked through. <laughs> there's nothing like there's nothing like looking at seeds around. That's, that's so much fun. Or what are some of the tools that you you would use in this type of work? Um, it's a 
important to have a good soil mix. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of just, um, there's a lot of luck involved, I think, sometimes. Um, I, a few years ago, um, we had a fire come by our, uh, in, our, in our area. And you know, they always say, what, what would you grab the first thing to put into your car? And probably the first thing, one of the first things I put in the car whenever all these fires were happening was my box with all my index cards that had like this seed, each, each species of plant that I plant has this little card where I got the seed, has it been stratified, has it been scarified, how long was it stratified for, when did you plant it? When did it come up? You know, and so each card will, and that's irreplaceable to me. How many different species or different ones would you have? Uh, this past year I did from seed probably at least 70 different seeds, different yeah. species. And how did you learn all of this, is what I want to know. Trial and error. <laughs> I worked for a nursery for a while and learned quite a bit really from them. Um, and then it's been helpful having other growers, you know, that will pitch in and just trial and error. Books or internet or any of that come into play? There's not, there really has not been much out there as far as books on native plants and how to grow native plants because native plants seem to have a little bit different um, requirements as far as getting them to germinate um, than like just the regular plants that you see. Um, probably one of the most helpful things I, I used was this nursery um, that just sells seeds called Prairie Moon Nursery and they would have a germination code for each seed that they carry and that has been tremendously helpful it was at the beginning. So. Buy a few and experiment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But they'd let you know, okay, this one needs to be scarified. This one needs to be stratified for at least 60 days. This one needs to be stratified for 90 days. This one is, you know. And what does stratified? Stratified means whenever you take the seed and you put it, I usually just use a little baggie and like some vermiculite that's damp. And what you're doing is you're mimicking the conditions that would be outside. Because most native plants need that time of cold, moist, time before they can germinate. Well, that's all. You get a refrigerator. Yeah, well, I do have a little refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> and I would imagine you'd need a, a camera, maybe, to take some mm. photographs, at least for your business, where you'd have Yeah, I do. I do some. And yeah. Stuff. Yeah. Facebook has helped a lot. Instagram has helped a lot on, as far as growing the business goes. And do you do uh, butterflies and caterpillars as well, or is it just Yeah, I do, just for fun, but I also, I try, if, if I've got them at all, I take them with me to shows, because most people don't understand the life cycle of a butterfly. They have no idea. They don't realize that each butterfly has its own food plant, and that's the only thing that that particular species of butterfly can eat. So. And how do you transplant or transport all of that? In little containers. <laughs> monarchs among those once in a while? Yeah, I like to bring monarchs. Um, like swallowtails are popular. Um, probably the, one of the cutest is the silver spotted skipper. It's a really cute little caterpillar. People love seeing it. So, so you, I imagine you're out in your field turning up leaves looking for these mm -hmm. things? Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? You need a magnifying glass then. Yeah, yeah. I always Maybe. I always carry loops with me whenever I go to shows and stuff, so people can look at the caterpillar, or the butterfly, or the chrysalis up close. And you always know that they've gotten into focus if they're looking at a monarch chrysalis, because then they'll go, <gasps> their breath will catch. <laughs> they'll go, oh, <laughs> because once you see that gold fleck on the chrysalis, it's just an up close under a loop. It's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, these painted ladies, so their, theirs wasn't very pretty. Yeah, but look at them under a loop sometime. I'll have to do that, yeah. I've seen pictures of the monarch ones, and they do look interesting. Mm -hmm. But the painted lady is kind of grayish. Okay. But it's amazing how many other colors are in there whenever you really look at them. Okay. And I noticed when they hatched, 
or when they came out of that, there was kind of a pinky, pink looking uh -huh. color down on the surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and I don't know what that was. Yeah, it was because the, their bodies have all that fluid and when they come, come out, just think of their, of the, um, the veins as being kind of like straws and they pump all that fluid into those straws and fill out their wings, kind of like a kite, and then, then they flush all that extra out of their body. And then they dry. And then they dry. Yeah, I got to see and one of them ready. do that. That was fun, fun to watch. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's an interesting business you're in. It has been fun. That's a yes. living, living thing. My husband's an accountant, so he has a real job. And <laughs> <laughs> but he's really gotten into it, too. He's, I, I couldn't do it without him. Without him. Well, have you tried something that failed? Uh, uh, yeah. Every year I try some plants that I fail with every year. And I usually do the same ones every year. <laughs> yeah. And eventually they work or it not. And so far they haven't. <laughs> so, you know, in some years you'll plant something and it'll just do great. And the next year you'll plant it and it doesn't do anything at all. You know, it doesn't grow the same, doesn't germinate the same. Just. And you keep records of that, mm -hmm. what you did, so mm -hmm. you can maybe figure out yeah. what worked and mm -hmm. what didn't. Mm -hmm. And you collect your own seeds from what you grow. I try to collect as many seeds as I can. You have an inventory of some kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do seed inventory every year and figure out what it is I need to try to go gather and beg off other growers. And <laughs> I have one grower sending me seed, and I'm sending her seed right now. So, not just in Oklahoma, but yeah, uh -huh. but that, there's a grower over in Arkansas that she and I exchange stuff. Well, it's your front yard. Do you mow? Do you mow your front yard? I do not mow my front yard, much to the consternation of my neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> but they're never outside anyway. But they and probably, we are. And they probably enjoy your flowers and your butterflies. You know, we have had some. I have found people taking pictures in my front yard of their children. Um, one gentleman in the neighborhood who had complained about our yard, and then became very ill, told another neighbor he had enjoyed while he was home watching the things in our yard, so. Yeah. Any of them follow suit and do a little bit more? In My neighbor room? next door to me does the same thing. And then the neighbor on the other side has started letting my stuff creep onto hers and not mowing as much. So. Well, educated in a way. Different, yeah, different it's just, way. it's fascinating to see what comes up every year. Things that we didn't plant or we didn't spread the seeds for. It's just, you know, did a, did a coyote walk through with something on its paw, did, you know, did a bird drop something, you know, how did it get here? Well, it's more, more than just butterflies too, it's the other bees, other oh, pollinators. Oh, bees, all the little pollinators, and yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, I would think at your festivals that you go to, it's probably children that like, that come up as interested, or? The children are interested. Everybody seems interested. Um, and there's some people I'm sure that aren't, but people who are in our booth generally are coming to our booth because they're interested in wildlife, which is why I named the nursery what we named it, you know, Wild Things Nursery. Um, and people just really seem to enjoy looking at things, and, you know. I had one lady, because I always sell black swallowtails, and I, and I mean, I don't sell black swallowtails, I sell parsley and fennel, which are not native, but they are a host for the black swallowtail butterfly. And so, whenever I sell that, I always say, okay, if you get a black swallowtail on this, I have a no squish rule, and you can't have, you know. And one lady, she was buying one, and I said, you know, I have a no squish rule. And she said, oh, I don't like caterpillars. I said, then you can't have the plant. <laughs> so she gave me my plant back and went and bought it from someone else because that's why I'm growing those. And, and anybody can get parsley and fennel at one of the other booths, but I'm trying to tell them that this is something that's going to... It's necessary to, for yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. So if it's not native, or is the butterfly native to Oklahoma? The butter, well, and the black swallowtail is our, is our state butterfly. But it's, um, they will go to things in the parsley family. Mm -hmm. So those are things that are in the parsley family, uh, fennel and, and parsley and root. 
but that doesn't grow wild, does it? It doesn't grow wild. Parsley and fennel don't grow wild here. They go to other things. They go to other to things, yeah. To that. But so much of our environment has been scalped. Yes. You know? So uh, that's one reason. People usually recognize the black swallowtail caterpillar and butterfly a lot of the time if they've done any gardening at all. I recognize the butterfly. I don't know if I would the caterpillar. Oh, it's a cute caterpillar. <laughs> I am learning these things. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you need to figure out what that funky one is that's orange and black with looks like spikes coming out of it. What's it's it hair, like? hairy? What's it I don't know. Okay. I, I'll, I'll have to the next time I see one I'll snap a picture okay. and send it. Send it. <laughs> <laughs> you could help educate. <laughs> so the reason I'm in this business? Yes. One reason I, one of the reasons I became interested in butterflies was whenever I was a kid. We had a neighbor that always grew cucumbers. And we would grow dill, and she would always make dill pickles and give us some of the dill pickles. So we would give her the dill, and there were all these, these little caterpillars that would be on there, so we'd squish them before we gave the dill to her, and then realized that those were going to be butterflies. So I guess I'm doing penance <laughs> for that. You know? um, yeah. So I'm trying to make up for of my past sins. <laughs> Since we're bringing up memories, is there, do you remember any, do you, your first memory of monarchs or a favorite memory of monarchs in general? I remember finding some on the chain link, sink, chain link fence, some chrysalises, and it was before we really understood about butterflies. And think, what are those? Because, you know, I, these earrings have gone, these are made out of glass. But it was like, what are those? They look like jewels. And realized that that was, we, we watched it and watched it. And probably there was blue vines somewhere growing back there because I don't think anybody else had milkweed. And that would have been when you were a child in mm -hmm. Oklahoma City? Mm -hmm. And did you live in, in the, inside the city mm -hmm. limits or whatever? Oh, yeah. 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 Well, I guess they grow anywhere and live anywhere with, if there's enough, mm -hmm. whatever they need. Yeah. Do your, did, were your sisters interested in? No, in they could not have carried less. <laughs> I think this, I was the youngest. I think this is the way for mother to find something for me to do because the other sisters, because the sisters weren't paying attention. Well, did your mother garden or have a Yeah, garden? she gardened, and one of my first memories, she had a whole bunch of zinnias, and there were lots of little brown butterflies on them. And I remember as a kid sitting there and watching all those butterflies fly around. And stuff. Oh, they were little skippers. Well, in Oklahoma City, since we're in that flight plan for or path for the monarchs, do you remember any huge masses coming through? You know, I don't remember them as a kid, having the huge masses of them. I remember when we first moved to Seminole, which was in early, mid-90s, I remember seeing huge swarms of them for the past 10 years now. just. One time I saw a whole bunch on a sycamore tree just roosting at night. But as far as like just these masses of them nectaring on, on plants, I haven't. It's been a while. Yeah, not yet. Maybe, maybe more since people are doing working toward getting more. Yeah, I hope so. I hope so. Are you a part of that, uh, that state plan that they seem to be working on? The Monarch on? Initiative? Uh -huh. I've been remiss on that. <laughs> I just haven't had time. To do that this summer. Uh, I understand there's probably 30 or 40 or more people on it. Yes, yeah, they had a, a huge turnout. Yeah, what yeah, it's been, it's been great. And the monarchs, bless their hearts, they're having to like carry the whole shoulder, you know, carry the load for all other insects. Um, you know, if we protect the monarchs, we're also protecting all these other pollinators that people don't know about. And that's, that's good. Bumblebees. Do you have a beehive on your property? I don't have a beehive. I'm going to have one next year. But those, see, but, but bees aren't native. Yeah. They're native to Europe. So, um, I try to, I don't use any pesticides or herbicides. Um, and I, I plant a variety of stuff. And if one of these eat all of your plants, you're okay with that before you can sell them? You know, the only time I've had um, plants that are eaten real badly before I sell them, um, 
the sleepy orange butterfly caterpillars. I sometimes have to hide my cassia plants from from them because they'll come in and lay eggs and strip them down to nothing. And they they relief within like two weeks, but it makes it a little bit hard to sell. But people who like native plants, they don't really care that much. Mm. They're like, yes, something like that. <laughs> and if I can say, oh, there's an egg, they'll go, yes, I want that one. So you check to make sure they have a few eggs before you, <laughs> before you leave the house. <laughs> yeah. You have a checklist in your head before you, yes. as you load yeah. up. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like I said, people just don't understand the life cycle, so. Well, and you mentioned you, you liked art, mm -hmm. art history or art. Mm -hmm. Are you, art. do you draw too? I mean, are you an yeah, artist? I do, I do some art, yeah. Do you do some of that with butterflies? A little bit, a little bit. More so? Do some photography type stuff with them. Okay. I was thinking you'd sketch this stuff and it would help. Oh, I do, I do. So, yeah. You can sell some of those, maybe. <laughs> Don't have time. <laughs> Don't have time. <laughs> Need more hours in our day. Well, if you're busy like January through April or May, mm -hmm. and then the other off the season, season, what would you be? What would you be doing? Well, after season, then you have to get everything that's left transplanted. You know, I do some trees, try to get everything put into the right size pots, get them healed in. You know, I think about gathering more seeds. If I need to order seeds. Is it, There's always something to do. Is it just you? I mean, besides it's just your, me. your husband no, it's doing just the me. accounting. But, it, it's or, just me. And he has a real job, so he <laughs> does his thing. Keeps you busy, I would think. Yeah. 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 And how many children did you say? I have, have two kids. Are they interested in any of this? Um, oddly, um, whenever they were little and we would be out in the car, they would scream, Don't let mom see the greenhouse! <laughs> um, but... Our son got a, his doctorate from OSU in forest genetics, and our daughter seems to be kind of interested in planting a garden too. So, but yeah. it's just a different—it's a different pace of life and different focus, I guess. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. And appreciate things that are growing around you. Mm -hmm. There's always something interesting. Always something new to learn. Well, and, and then if you don't know something, do you have a particular person that you? Say, hey, this is happening. What can you? What do you know about it? Depends on what it is. Um, there's, you know, one good thing about Facebook. There's so many different groups. There's the Bug Hunters of Oklahoma group. There's a Spider group. There's a Herpetology group. There's, you know, several butterfly groups. So there's always somebody that you can go to and say, you know, hey, I found this. What do you think it could be? You know, why is this happening? Other aphids, people have trouble with aphids. Oh, those oleander aphids on the milkweed. <laughs> I hate those things. Not native. They came over on oleander plants, and that's why they're everywhere now. And they're good botanists. They can find the milkweed where nobody else can. So. Oh. Now there's humidity. I know, humidity. but they are born pregnant with their great-grandchildren. They're awful. <laughs> <laughs> I just ate them. Yeah, that's probably one of the things that people worry about the most, just those awful orange aphids. Yeah. And then you do you have to worry about uh, prim manis, prim manis, manis prim I don't, I don't see them that much. Dragonflies? I usually, like on monarchs, I'll collect them as eggs. I do as many butterflies from eggs as I can because that seems to cut back a whole lot on the predator issue, the disease issue. So you're checking your leaves a lot then, mm -hmm. or you'll spot a butterfly and figure mm -hmm. out we'll check that later? Yeah, follow it around. Yeah. yeah. Um, but how many do they lay on a on one plant, like a monarch? You know, you sometimes think? people say, "Oh, they just lay one per plant," and I don't find that to be true. Um, I, I've I've seen stems of milkweed that are only like this high, and a monarch will have laid like you know 15 eggs on it because they're such good botanists and they know where their plants are and they know they have to lay them on that. But it won't support that many. It won't. It won't, but that's Maybe. why it's important for everybody to, to try to plant, not just for monarchs, but for all these other things that we've um, eliminated from the environment. 
the man that explained milkweed to me was saying there's something it has kind of hairs on it. Okay. Some some of the leaves. Uh -huh. Yeah. Some types have. Uh, yeah, and that they'll mow that Shoot. down before they oh, okay before they, that. before they start now I know something new. <laughs> before they start eating uh -huh. you know, clear their spot then yeah uh -huh. they'll hatch uh -huh. out and they eat their little egg first yeah it's science I mean you know science teachers I guess that's where kids get this initially in elementary grades mm -hmm. or sixth seventh eighth grade mm -hmm. go back to school and get yours. Uh -huh. A PhD in yeah. botany or horticulture or something. <laughs> yeah. You're having too much fun to do that. No, my dad said when I took off for college, my dad said she needed to major in horticulture. Your dad did. Yeah, I should have listened to him. Have you told him that? I passed away, but um, before I started the business. But you know, I think in some ways coming to the business the way that I came to it has been beneficial. In some ways, because um, I decided to go after what I was passionate about and not what I had just learned from other people. Does that make sense? Well, why Seminole? We moved there for a job. And we lived in Texas for a while and moved to Seminole. For an accounting? For an yeah. accounting job. Yeah. yeah. And, that's and we're out in the country. Uh, it's not that far from Oklahoma City. No, it's I not guess. too bad. It's not too bad. We have great sunsets. So that helps. It's pretty flat. <laughs> it, it really is a little hillier than what you think it, it is. Enough room for milkweed. Enough room for milkweed. Well, uh, if you don't have enough in your garden supply for you, your cultivars, how do you get more? I go out and look for blue vine. Oh, you go out. <laughs> I go out and look for blue vine. <laughs> With clippers and <laughs> with clippers and a cup of water, and I go up and down alleys. <laughs> I did it, and we woke up the other day. So, yeah. ever, anyone ever stop you and say, "What are you doing?" Yeah, so somebody we woke up stopped and said, "Thank you so much for weeding our flower beds." <laughs> and I said, "I'm not weeding your flower beds. I'm just getting blue on." <clears throat> I tried to explain to them, but they didn't seem to be interested. And they weren't upset that you... Oh, no. They weren't it. upset that I was getting this weed that they thought was a weed. Well, when you're out traveling around to, to shows and things, do you often stop by the road and get... I get try to get everything. No, I get everything before I leave. But but caterpillars go on a vacation with us, too. Um, I've taken monarchs to um, Trail Ridge Road at Estes and Rocky Mountain National Park because um, I can't leave them behind. They went... I had a whole group that go, went with us to the eclipse and then went to Wisconsin to Lake Superior a couple of weeks ago. By group, how many are we talking? Oh, I had about 15 monarchs and I had some American snout butterflies and some chrysalises of black swallowtails. And you uh, kind of a case, I mean... Just, you... It's just like a pet carrier. It's a, it's a plastic case with a kind of a lid with holes in the top of it. And they can all be in the same thing? Yeah, these, these were all in separate things, mostly. Um, but they're not going to try to eat the other one's plant, because if they go to another one's plant, and, you know, if a monarch eats anything but milkweed, they'll die. Okay. And I'll, I'll cat for worship with that. I can just picture you carrying these things <laughs> into the hotel rooms at night. Well, it was cool enough I was able to leave them outside. <laughs> Although I did have to bring some in and transfer the monarchs babies over to, oh well, yeah, I just took blue vine with me, yeah, kept it refrigerated, <laughs> I couldn't how, leave them behind. Judge how much you need, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they were well traveled, they'd already gone 2,700 miles by the time they got back. Well, I'm thinking the monarchs up in the Rockies, the air level's different, I mean, you wonder if, if they struggled didn't with seem that. To, it didn't seem to bother the caterpillars. We didn't turn them loose there. I mean, it was, they were still a caterpillar. It's, in my mind, it's kind of like being a dairy farmer. You can't, you can't leave. <laughs> can't it. leave it. You can't leave for very long. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah, exactly. I know a lot of the butterfly people like seeing the schmales. Like, okay, caterpillar season is over, because it can be a little bit exhausting changing their food out if you're doing a whole bunch, especially. 
and you had to clean out the bottom? Yeah, you had to clean out the bottom and really need to go over and sterilize stuff. So it's more to it than what you would, you know, mm -hmm. think it yeah. sounds like. Uh -huh. yeah. A common person would not know how to do all of that. The average Probably person, not. Like yeah. not common, the average person would yeah. know. Yeah. yeah. You give lessons. Do I give lessons? <laughs> Uh, I'll answer questions. <laughs> yeah. People come to your place and say, show me how to do this? Uh, I've had some people do that, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know, it's just, it just seems to open up people's minds a little bit whenever they can watch that process. Well, when you when you sell the, the live things, the critters at I, the market... I don't, I don't sell the critters. I don't. Unless, if there's an egg on something, I think about it and sometimes if I have eggs on something I'll put it back and if somebody I know and I trust and I then I'll let them buy that one. And can you tell what's what with just their with the egg? Yeah because you know, of what's laid on. Because it's what it's laid on. Oh because that yeah. makes it that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I'll get it eventually. Yeah. So you've got to have a variety of things in your yard. Yeah. But I think also one of the things they're emphasizing, I think, with the Monarch Initiative is planting of nectar plants, too. And that's, um, I think, generally we don't have that much trouble with nectar plants, but so many things now are hybridized. They don't have the nectar in them that our native plants do. Um, and so putting those native plants out there that are going to be blooming in the fall especially whenever these monarchs are coming through. And it seems like our butterfly populations are always bigger in the fall than they are any other time of the year. So it's important to have those nectar plants there. Also, that's the tropical milkweed. Well, tropical milkweed is, is okay for nectar. Um, really my favorite nectar plant would probably be the asters, aster oblongifolius, the aromatic aster is awesome. You can hear that plant in the fall whenever it's blooming because there's so many bees and butterflies and everything's on that plant. It's just going crazy. Um, golden crown beard is good. Um, our sunflowers, like swamp sunflower, those are those are good plants. Mist flower is good. Golden rod. Golden rod. You know, I don't see as many butterflies on that as what I do. The other plants, uh, I see a lot of um, little beetles and stuff on the golden rod. And I think a lot of the tiny little pollinators that we really don't pay much attention to are on the golden rod. So you'd need three or four growing seasons, I mean, blooming cycles, or something that's going to bloom? You know, if, I, if I was going to plant any, if I was going to plant for any season, it would probably be fall. If, if, you know, just that we need those things blooming in the fall for these monarchs going back. Um, you know, even hummingbirds on their way going back, they need, they need that. Well, do they like uh, crepe myrtles? I mean, that blooms. No. How about the butterfly bush? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's a wonderful book called Bringing Nature Home by Doug Palamy. And if you ever have a chance to read that, do. And um, it just kind of gives you the whole link between native plants. Insects only go to native plants. And um, birds have to have insects to feed their young. Even a hummingbird's diet is 85 to 90% insects. And we don't think about that. Um, and they can't feed them seeds. They can't feed their baby seeds. They can't feed them sugar water. You know, they have to feed them protein. Because ounce for ounce, there's more, there's more protein in an insect than there is in bee. So, if you want songbirds, you have to have those native plants for the insects for their birds. And, and like a, one chickadee needs just like six to eight thousand caterpillars to feed one clutch of young. But yeah, you on know, something like a crepe myrtle or a butterfly bush, there's no caterpillars. There's no, mm -hmm. there's no um, other kind of life there at all. Well, that may be why they're popular at places where they don't want. 
Yeah, that, that, that whole thing of pest free. Yeah. It's not a good thing to say pest free. But something like an oak tree has been documented to have like over 400 different kinds of lepidoptera, you know, butterflies or moths that will use that, use an oak tree for their larval host plants. So it's not just plant plant. I mean, it, in my mind, I don't think of trees as being hosts for oh, yeah. butterflies. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, they are. Be. Yeah, wild black cherry, sassafras, um, elm, hackberry, all of those are awesome plants for butterflies. Well, native uh, red bud, mm -hmm. red yeah. bud, yeah, but not imported red bud. It'd have to be well, a common native. I, I think most of our red buds, I think, are native to the United States. Uh, the Sursus canadensis, which is Oklahoma's red bud. Well, tapping into your knowledge, what about Bradford pears? Ooh, the scourge of the earth. I hate those things. <laughs> I'm beginning to, yes. Oh, I hate those things. It's one of the worst things that ever happened to our environment, I think, is. Well, do the insects. Cal calorie pears. Do the insects like them? No, not particularly. Birds like to eat the, the seeds um, of the fruits and they spread them everywhere. So they're becoming. They're becoming quite a problem. They don't Taking live them. very long, though. Twenty or so. They're years. so susceptible to ice storms, and wind damage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wonder since they were invented or came up with at OSU. Yeah, they're really displacing a lot of the native species because they're a lot more vigorous than, than the natives are. Well, the oak is it post oak or blackjacks or? You yeah, know, the one that Doug Tallamy had, had done. I, he just said oak tree, so I'm not sure which, but I mean, blackjack, bur oak, all of those species of oak, all of them are great. That's not part of your, your business, though. You don't do trees? I do a few trees, not very many, but I do bur oak and I do um, blackjack oak. And what about mimosas? Ooh. <laughs> they have a pretty bloom. Although, I just they're, they're a good climbing tree if you're a kid. <laughs> But they're, they're another there's, that's not native, that really nothing's going to come to them and feed off of them. Yeah, I don't know all these things I'm learning. <laughs> you watch the garden show? I guess I should start watching I the garden show. I never watch the garden. I, I, I do some, but not as like I should. It's the wrong time of the day. <laughs> so how early do you get started on your, when you're working in your nursery? Uh, not quite an early, but if I'm more of, a, of an evening person, oh, okay. <laughs> morning person. So spend about six hours a day or more? Oh, yeah, off and on, off at on. least, yeah. yeah. And then, then the butterfly season, maybe a little bit more? Yeah, yeah. The spring season is yeah, easily at least 12 to 16 hours. What do you go to, like elementary schools and do classes? I do, do some classes. Times. Yeah, yeah. I give talks here and there. What's your favorite part of, of doing all of this? I have, um, <laughs> I've taken pictures with the parents' permission off and on of kids holding a butterfly or a caterpillar. And I just love to have, hand a child a caterpillar and they're so open to it. They're not scared or anything. And I've had adults be scared of caterpillars. But the kids hardly ever are scared of them. And they just think that's the most fascinating thing in the world, to get to hold a caterpillar in their hand. And it, it just kind of, it, it just kind of lights up their day. And I've had people like at Audubon and stuff, they go, oh, there's the butterfly lady. You know, they always come to our house because they want their kids to see caterpillars. And that's just always, cool. that's special. And then on the reverse of that, what's your least favorite part? Um, that one's harder to say just because I really enjoy what I do. <laughs> oh, well, well, I would say you should probably say taking the one back that's that you no swoosh rule. <laughs> Having to ask for the no, I like, you can't have that one. Having to ask for it back. <laughs> um, I mean, there's there's something, you know, people always think, oh, I want to go work with plants. And, you know, if you're out there and the wind is blowing about 50 miles an hour and there's 
a chance of a freeze for the next day and you have a show the next day and you're trying to get all this stuff moved back into the greenhouse or covered up, those things aren't fun particularly, but it's just part of it. Do you have a problem with mosquitoes? No, really don't. Hmm. I don't so much. I've got a lot of birds in the neighborhood though, so. Which is another reason why I collect eggs and caterpillars a lot. Preventative measure. Preventative measure, particularly on the monarchs and stuff, because <laughs> otherwise the birds will get it. <laughs> well, what's the furthest distance you will go for a show? Um, we do. Uh, if, if something is special going on, like like in far north, west Oklahoma, we always just stay in Oklahoma, Oklahoma. so far. So, anywhere else. Native plants to native to Oklahoma or to mm -hmm. the Great Plains? No, to Oklahoma is what we specialize in. Okay. So at least 95% of what we have is native to Oklahoma. And some grasses in there? Yeah, I love grasses. It's a hard sell though. People don't like grasses as much as they should. Yeah, and the aren't. sedges. I love sedges. And they don't like sedges as much as they should. That's improving over time. Well, sage has a, or some sage has that pretty purple blossom on it uh, and I'm thinking of the right plant. We don't have, that That sage is not native. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so there's low cell stuff that's native. Every <laughs> once in a while they might, but you have to be careful. Like when you, I, I don't think Lowe's does it now, but I know Home Depot have, could be treated with neonicotinoids. Oh, I always pronounce it wrong which is a systemic pesticide. So you have to be really careful whenever you're buying things from vendors, from people, um, that they haven't been treated with a systemic mm -hmm. pesticide, which will kill, of course, anything that plants on. Well, then spiders, does that come into play? I love spiders. I do, yeah. Because, again, um, and then they put a camera in a wren's box and watched what the wren fed her young. Most of what she brought back were spiders. Mm. So to me, everything has a place, you know, in the environment. Just step back. And it's an ecosystem. It really it's is. And I never had goat weed butterflies at our house. I never noticed any. And whenever I was a kid, that was one of the first butterflies I ever identified. I was walking home from school, and there was something on the road. I picked it up, took it home, and my mother and I pried it apart, and we figured out it was a dead goat with butterfly. So that was always stuck in my mind. And then I got some croton seeds from somebody, planted croton, and now I've got goat weed butterflies in there. So kind of if you plant it, they will come. Goat weed butterfly. I've never heard of that. It's a beautiful little. Very um, elegant looking little butterfly, kind of a red color. I was going to say what color? Yeah, dark red, but whenever its wings are folded up, it looks just like a, a dead leaf. And it's cool when it hatches, and you take it out and you put it on a flower, it falls over dead like, don't pay attention to me, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> defense mechanism. Yeah, maybe. defense mechanism, then after a while, it's like a possum, it'll stand back up and fly off. <laughs> Observing little things like that. Uh -huh. neat. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. You appreciate nature and the simple things and, and then the magnitude of it in, in a sense too. Yeah. 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 Probably one of my favorite tools is, is having a, a loop, having a magnifying glass and looking at things. Because, you know, what the giant swallowtail caterpillar. At first it looks like bird poop, and then as it becomes bigger, to me it looks kind of like a copperhead snake. But you look at it, and it's kind of like the brown of one of these chairs, with a little bit of a white on it. But when you look at it under a loop, there's all these, there's all these blue specks on it. It's just gorgeous when you look at it up close. That's now if you could translate it into call it art, paint it. There you go. <laughs> I'll do that. <laughs> A freezing in, in the wintertime, I guess, would be the hard, I mean, the ice storms that we get. Do you know, though, I have, I have found that native plants, they don't care. The last winter was probably harder on my stuff 
than the year we had the freezes that went down to negative. The, when it's real warm and then it goes cold for like a day and then it goes back up to warm again, that's not good. But I, out on our little prairie area, I have found caterpillars nestled in the ice underneath a leaf. Um, so they have their mechanisms of being able to and still survive. Alive. Oh yeah, yeah. That's just how they're getting through the winter. Do you watch the Weather Channel then, or keep up with the weather report, or There's just so look out in the do. morning? There's so little I can do about the weather. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's true. I mean, if something's coming through, well, you could cover. Yeah, I cover. cover. Yeah, could cover yeah. or bring bring stuff in if you have yeah. space to bring yeah. it in. Yeah. Truly, that's that's probably the least favorite thing is just the what's it going to do like. Especially like I said if it's been really warm and we've had like in the 60s or 70s and they're saying it's going to get down to 25. And you can't take your chances. You've got you, to, you can't take chances whenever you have a short season. Yeah. You, do you envision doing this for a long, more, long, long time? Until I always said I was going to do it until I was didn't enjoy it anymore. I don't believe in doing something I don't I don't want to do that to people <laughs> you know I want to feel just as excited about that plant this year as I did 10 years ago and you're not there yet and I'm not there yet okay. I still so when the time comes to sell wild things it will be difficult oh I don't know I just probably just close it down but, um, <laughs> I said we've just met some of the most interesting people that we would never have been able to get to know. People in the Native Plant Society, Audubon, and the other growers. We've just had a ball doing it. Well, do you have a Monarch Way Station, a registered one? <laughs> I did not have one registered. That was on my to-do list for the summer. I didn't get that done, did I? But you I'm going to do it. You bet you could. I could. I just haven't gone through. Well, I'm not sure what all that entails, what it takes in order to get registered. You have to fill out the thing and then they send you a sign. But it doesn't have to be a certain size? No, you just have to have, I think, a certain number of nectar plants and larval host plants and you don't use pesticides. Well, you've got it's that just, covered. Oh, yeah, I've got it all covered. I just, <laughs> I'll do that. Well, there's quite a few in Oklahoma when, yeah, there I, when are. I was looking. There are. Yeah. yeah. And Chip's done an awesome job bringing all the monarch stuff to the forefront. Well, the, the zoo is going to have a monarch run, madness, monarch madness run. Oh, really? Yeah, and, and proceeds are to go to educate more uh -huh. people about the uh -huh. issues with monarchs, but uh -huh. yeah, you want to go trot, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I don't know, they may have a, a, a a fair of sorts to go along with it uh -huh. with vendors coming in. I, I think I, I think in Tulsa this coming weekend there's a on Turkey Mountain or something there's a monarch thing. Okay, yeah. check that too. Yeah. And Sandy was saying they do counts. Mm -hmm. Do you do you go? Do you participate? I've done the butterfly counts a few times. That's, that was fun to do. Is it, it would to me it would seem like it'd be hard. I mean you'd have to know. Your you know. Kinds. I've been on and just been amazed at these people who will see something 20 feet away and they go, oh, that's a fiery skipper. And I'm like, <laughs> skippers just totally bewilder me. <laughs> I sit there with a book going, oh, but, um, but they can tell a mile away what they are. So someone shouted out and you, you, and you do the check mark? Yeah, they just, yeah, they, they keep tally of them. You know, we see so many monarchs, so many queens, so many fiery skippers, so many red spotted purples, so many, you know. Uh, how, close, how close to your neighborhood do they come to do something like that? Probably the closest I think that they've ever done to my neighborhood was Pontotoc Ridge. Have you ever been to Pontotoc Ridge? Mm -hmm. That's a nature conservancy spot and it's south of Ada. And I think they have the highest count of butterflies there of any place in the state, in the state I believe. Wow. They have a higher species count. And about what would be the best time of year to go visit? A lot of times they do the butterfly counts in the summer. I like Pontotoc Ridge any time of the year. Um, you have to to get with the manager of the of the place, but it's just an interesting 
it's, it's an interesting place. To Would monarchs go through there? Mm -hmm. Would they? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Coming up September, mm -hmm. yeah, getting close to that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, the Chickasaws helped them buy some other property south of Ponte Cruz, it's Nature Conservancy, and that's called Oka Yanali. And it's got a mile of the Blue River through there, and they have some seaside alder there. Mm. Which I, are you familiar with seaside? Seaside alder is a plant that grows in Delaware. Some little island or something, I think, in Georgia, and on the Blue River of Oklahoma. The only place you're going to find seaside alder, and they've got it growing there. So that's that's pretty special. Yeah. And they have this place. They have a bouncy bog, which the water from the Blue River. You could stand in this area and jump, and it's like jumping on a waterbed, and you can see the ripples going out. It's just it's an amazing place. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, 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 that's fine. Tourist Oklahoma. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we've got some interesting places in the state. You know, in Oklahoma, that's why I think we rank 13th in biodiversity oh, in the United good. States. Partly because, you know, you look at southeast Oklahoma, you have orchids, gorgeous orchids down in southeastern Oklahoma. And then in the far northwest of the Panhandle, totally different plants up there. Um, so we have all these different ecosystems here. Cacti, I guess would be. Yeah, what cactus. Would be what would be, uh -huh. I don't know, Gaiman area, what would be out there? Uh, yeah, they've got cactus out there. They've got um, buffalo gourds. They've got um, bush morning glory, which is kind of a cool plant. It has, um, has a root that goes down like six feet. It's like which, I mean, a lot of our native plants will go down like 25 feet, but I mean, the, the root that you can dig out, it's like, they call it man root because it's as big as a person that they wow. dig out. And the plant's only about yay tall, <laughs> but it has this root that's like enormous. Yes, that's to handle the drought. They've adapted to the drought. Exactly, water. exactly. Yeah. So native plants go down 25 feet? Some of them can, like that's lead plant. That's all, that's all. Lead plant, um, compass plant. That, and that's one thing I love about the native plants. There are just so many cool things about them. I love the history of them and what people used them for and the different properties that they have. Like one plant called Tephrosia virginica. Um, the Native Americans would like dam up a, a creek. They'd put branches across it. And then they would take these roots and throw them into the water, chop them up, throw them in the water. And it would stun the fish. The chemical that was in this root was stunned the fish, and then that could just sweep the fish up. Hmm. And how did they? How, did how they who, who decided that? that? <laughs> and then there's one plant um, called desmanthus that, um, so the, the Native Americans would use it, um, put it in their eye if they had an eye infection, which I can't imagine putting anything in my eye if you have an eye infection. It hurts, and this is a decent sized seed. But it turns out this has antibacterial properties too. Who was the first one to figure that? Figure that out. I don't know. You know, things that will heal wounds, things that will cause milk production, things that will cause milk production to stop. You know, all these different. But do you have to share some of that information from people who are buying things from you? A lot of people are interested in knowing some of that what, stuff, what they and, can do and, and so you know you're always hesitant to you know you don't want to recommend medicines for somebody. Yeah. But you know a lot of people that's why they are looking for things because they just think even though they're not going to use it themselves, they want that connection. Mm -hmm. um, there's one plant um, called prickly ash that's a host plant for the giant swallowtail butterfly. And if you chew on it, it's called toothache tree, and it will numb your mouth. And they would also use the thorns and stick it into the gum to help help relieve pain. Again, I don't, I don't know who the first person was to say, this might be a good idea. <laughs> Let's stick this thorn in my sore throat, in my sore gum. So. There's so much pain, I'll try anything. Yeah, but I just think it's so fascinating about the native plants, you know. The history of it, that you just don't get with with all these plants that come over from 
other countries. They just don't have any character to me. Well, the ones that would have to be 25 feet deep, you can't really dig those up and transplant them. Not, not very well. So if you try to grow one from a seed, it could be a challenge? It, you can grow them from seed, but they're slow growing, which is another problem, I think, with native plants and why you don't see them more like Lowe's. Because they never, or they, no, that's how it's never. They don't often look as good in the pot unless they've been really, really fertilized as they would as, as like a plant that's been grown for a pot to be sold in a store. Like the bumps this time of year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect shape and everything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's the most expensive plant you sell? Hardest to we do it because we are just do shows. We just sell everything by the size that it's in because we don't have time whenever we're slammed at a show to try to go, oh, okay, this one's 12, this one's 14, this one's 2, this one, you know. So it's like if it's in this size pot, it is this price no matter what. Um, but there are some rarer than others that would, would warrant a higher yeah. price? Um, Probably the only ones that I do that's that's going to be any higher would be pawpaws, just because it takes them a long time to um, get the pawpaw big enough to really sell. I'm not sure what a pawpaw. Pawpaw is. tree, picking up pawpaws, putting them in my pocket. No. Uh, pawpaws, <laughs> papa. Yeah, it's pawpaw, and they have a fruit. Some people call it southern banana. Um, it it's kind of a custardy kind of consistency. Um, has a huge leaf on it, but it's a food plant for the zebra swallowtail, which they have more of in the northeastern part of the state. Real interesting bloom on it, but it just takes a little bit longer to grow. And how many, how many do that you have around your place? I have like three planted at my house. I love those and I love sassafras, but again, I, I just sell sassafras for the regular price, so. You always have plants you like better than others. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to tell the other ones about it, but you do. <laughs> I mean, common like the zinnias and... Yeah, they aren't native. I do plant some zinnias, though, just because I, I just okay. like to cut them and bring them inside. Well, growing up, there was something we would call sweet peas. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. that native? No. Nope. <laughs> <Okay. I'm> sorry. <laughs> Dandelions? Not native. They were brought over by miners. Wow. But they are good, dandelions are good though for those early emerging ground bees. They're good because, they, you know, dandelions will bloom one of the first things to bloom, so. What about that purple thistle, thistle that you see? Yeah, some of the purple, purple thistle is, um, say that they're native. Yeah, say, say that, that 10 times. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're native and, and they're, yeah, and they can be a food plant for the regular plant painted lady. Butterflies? Uh -huh. Pick your brain, you know all of this. <laughs> Not all of it. And that's one of the neat things, like if you're on a Native Plant Society walk or something, which our walks are not really walks. <laughs> They're like walk two feet, everybody stare at something on the ground, and then 15 minutes later you move another two feet. But there's all these people who have all this knowledge. You know, you have these people who look at things from the um, botanical, you know, like how many you know, is it her suit? Is it partially her suit? Is it, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then you have other people who are, you know, who are more like into, this was used by the Native Americans for this and this and this. And then you have other people like, well, I'm a forager and so I would eat this plant and I would do this. So it's just interesting, all those different viewpoints. But again, you just don't get with the crepe myrtle. <laughs> No. <laughs> well, over the course of like from 2002, you said you started uh -huh. until to now, your popular item has changed. What you sell the most of has changed. Uh, probably our top sellers would be the tropical milkweed. Now, for all the whole time. For the whole time, and uh, blackfoot daisy. People love blackfoot daisy, which is a, a little native that's you find in western Oklahoma, just kind of growing on clay outcrops, just kind of in 70 mile an hour winds, if you've ever been out to western, you know, yeah. and somehow they hang on uh, in clay. Um, 
and people love that. Um, but I, I have seen a shift in things because a lot of times people it seemed like at the first they would just go for the things that they recognized from gardening magazines. Like they would recognize the term Joe Pie weed, you know. And even though I don't think Joe Pie does that well in Oklahoma, we have a native here, but I don't think it, it's I don't think it's as much bang for the buck as other things are. But things are familiar. But as they, as they become more sophisticated and more knowledgeable. I think people are, I, th I think what they're planning has changed. People are much more interested in grasses than they used to be. Um, and then just kind of some of the quirky plants that don't get much press. And there's a lot of those out there that you just have to kind of explain to somebody. And once you explain why that is really a cool plant, then they'll start to buy it. I would think more there with more subdivisions. There's probably I don't know if people would grow native plants if they're not going to look. I know. I see, and that's look. that's one of the sad things. You know, we go in, and we scrape off the land, and then we bring in Bermuda sod, and then they plant a red tip photinia and some boxwoods, and call it a day. And you've just you've just eliminated probably at least at least in that area 50 native plants and you've replaced it with maybe five so all those things I, I, they say that for every native plant there's 40 other there's 40 animals that that need that plant that will use utilize that plant so four zero four zero so look at how many how many insects have, that you've displaced in that, you know, that in bad. that American yard, the, you know, you yes. good Americans mow their lawn and stuff like that. And plant knockout roses. And plant knockout roses, which bring in the rose flowers, yeah. Butterflies probably don't even like them. They well, don't. Not even the nectar out of No, I, I, I have, we have several net roses that are native to Oklahoma. They're all single petal. You know, I'm five petal roses and stuff, and I'll see butterflies sometimes, beetles on them quite a bit, um, and other little pollinators, but the hybrid teas and stuff, no, I couldn't care less. Well, on the, on the plants that you start from seed and things, do they ever cross? I've had a, the, the only things that I've really seen cross much, I've had some of the, the iron weeds cross. Which butterflies like those? Uh, the silver spotted skippers really like to nectar on those. They're purple, aren't they? Yeah, the iron, uh, iron wings are deep purple. Kind of a royal purple. The only other one I'm familiar with is Queen Anne's lace. Not native. Not native. Not even. But you find it in, in wildflower seed packets you sometimes. Do. Yes. Places. But it's in the parsley family. Sometimes the black swallowtails will use it. I don't think they use it that much. And, and that's another thing, you know, we have all this thing, you know, what is, a, what is a native, what's a wildflower? People think bachelor buttons are a wildflower. Well, they've naturalized, but they're not, they're not a native wildflower, they're native to Europe. So naturalized is a mean in what? It means it goes crazy. It means, it means if you plant one, then after a while you'll have a whole bunch and they just kind of, you know, they just come up every year. Mm -hmm. They might not be invasive, so to speak, but they have naturalized. And that's not a good thing, necessarily. They yeah. don't do that much. Well, do the natives ever naturalize? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's why you have them by the side of it. I was going to say, with your blue blue vine. Yeah. It does in some blue places. And I've had several things come up in my yard that I didn't, that must have just been there in the seed bank of the yard. Um, and we try to burn, like, every three or four years, we burn off a little section of the yard, which is... Kind of fun if you're a pyromaniac, and uh, and you'll always have different things come up here. Well, like a prescribed burn. Mm -hmm. Your neighbors yeah. are probably interested. We do in it. That. We do it late at night. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of on the end of the street. Nobody cares. I don't think that much. But but one plant in our yard. And this is totally unacceptable. But we always have this little plant that we come up, and I go, what is that? 
they come up just great guns in the spring. And I think, yes, it's going to bloom this year. This shiny little green leaf, a little pointed into it. Finally, and it never did anything, finally realized um, it was called, it's called an adder's tongue fern. It was a fern. It's just one little leaf. And it turns out it has more chromosomes than any other living thing on Earth. Of course, I didn't plant it. It was just there. And our front yard used to be part of a tank farm. So it's just, it had been laying dormant in the soil all those years. But it's cool to look at that and think, that has more chromosomes than anything else on the entire Earth. That's 1,260 chromosomes. And so that's one of the fun things to me about growing natives is that you just never know what you're doing. And how big would that one get? Oh, it can make it about you tall. Doesn't get any taller than that. Doesn't get any taller than that. And what's its purpose? I mean, what, what, I don't know. what, what, what likes it? I would love to know what its purpose is. I don't know what its you purpose know what is. Likes I haven't it. figured it out. You haven't found anything on it? Mm -hmm. I haven't found anything on it. I haven't found anything eating on it. But I figure it's doing something there. There's some reason why it's still... And it doesn't spread? It does a little bit, but it would never be considered invasive. You know, things come up in between and stuff. I wonder how deep its roots are if it's not very late. deep. Not only about that deep. Huh. But that's just one of the cool things about growing native plants, sure. especially whenever you have an area that you're not, you know, you're not a control freak. You're not going, okay, you're going to be here, and you're going to be there, and you're going to be here, and anything else gets weeded out. If you just let it kind of go, it's just fascinating. Doesn't always look neat and tidy, but it, it's it's doing a lot of work. I think neat and tidy is highly overrated. I'm beginning to think so too with this project. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always funny. We always have some some sunflowers outside the kitchen window, and I just love watching the birds in the wintertime coming and eating all those little seeds and stuff. A never a dull moment at your house. Let's well, see if I'd majored in horticulture. I wouldn't have, you know. Maybe, but not as much, I would have, wouldn't think. I just think I'd have a different viewpoint. I think, you know, I just think I'd look at it differently. Almost spiritual in a sense, isn't it? Different you from know, religious, but spiritual. Yeah, I think it, I think it is. I, I, one year I sold, um, some plants to a lady at Audubon, and I think I gave her a caterpillar, which I have to really feel inspired to give somebody a caterpillar. And she came back the next year, and her son had been killed not long after, uh, at this summer, I think he had been killed like in the fall. And she said, or I guess it was that same, she said, because that's what got her through year was watching the caterpillars metamorphosize into butterflies you know and you know I don't want to put too much hallmark cards <laughs> on this stuff but I think it does um, connect people in a way that a lot of times we don't stop and try to connect with things around us. It makes you slow down a little bit too mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it does and I had some last a few weeks ago just going through a horrible divorce and I didn't even know this was happening and I'd given her some monarch eggs while we were on vacation and I said can you take some of these and and watch them and and then I found out when we got back that you know this was going on in her life and things have been really horrible and she said this is what's getting me through it. She used to go out and hunt milkweed. She <laughs> yeah but just watching this has just been she said it just has been life of and I think watching nature can do that for us. I think we, we kind of have nature deficits. So, yeah. Well, hopefully the monarchs, this initiative that's going around the country, maybe that'll help spur, I think it is. spur mm -hmm. people on. You know, I, a couple of years ago when we were up here, and the, the monarchs, the stuff about the monarchs had just started coming out, and we were up in Tulsa. And, uh, People were driving in from Kansas and Missouri and everything, looking for milkweeds. 
They had made a special trip down just to find milkweeds because they heard that the monarchs needed it. And I think people just want to feel like something that they do matters. Mm -hmm. You just picture all these people out in the fields saying, oh, there's one, let's dig it up. And these farmers. That's, yeah, that's, yeah. Farmers would be thankful, I guess, in some sense, too, because cows don't. Yeah, and sometimes farmers go out there, ranchers go out there and spray the bees. <laughs> well, that's true, too. Yeah. Maybe they, they were looking to purchase milk. Yeah, they were from, looking from, to. From all of them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, is that the case now? I mean, are enough are enough sellers out there to meet it's the demand? Get, it's getting better um, because that first year that all of it hit, I think most of the growers that were doing milkweeds were totally unprepared. We had no idea the demand that was going to be out there. And you can't make a great seed grow any faster than what is growing, you know? Yes. It's just life. Um, and so there have been more growers getting into milkweeds, which is a good thing. I think part of the thing that Chip Taylor is doing, you have to have 2,500 plant, 2,500 plants okay. for his grant, mm -hmm. the grant that okay. he's done with mm -hmm. the tribes, mm -hmm. 2,500. Yeah. I don't know if that's over the course of three years or if that's each year. I'm not sure. I bet I'm not sure. It either. seems like, I mean, it take, it have to get the seeds somewhere. Yeah, and I think they were doing plugs. Oh, that um, make And I work. think they were using a place in Ada to do a lot of these milkweed plugs for the tribes. So they'd have to know ahead of time. That yeah, because it takes it takes a good four months at least, really, to you know by the time you get them stratified, get them planted, and get them where they they can go in the ground. And then once they go in the ground, it's hard to keep them get them started. I I feel that way on some of these natives. Like once want to be paying attention and taking good care of them to get them to go? Well, sometimes it's not so much you're taking good care of them, sometimes it's taking too good of care of them. Ah, okay. Um, they're just not, milkweeds are just not as easy to establish as I wish that they were. Well, if someone was standing in front of you saying, okay, if I'm only gonna plant like five things, what would you, what would you recommend? Are these larval plants or host plants? We're talking just monarchs or what? Any butterfly, any butterfly. Any butterfly. Any butterfly. Any butterfly. The five plants I take with me on a desert island. Okay. I don't think I can live without Aster of Longifolius. I think I have to have that one. Um, I love Golden Crown Beard. Just like, name your favorite child. <laughs> um, That's the thing, there's, every plant has something going for it. Okay. You know? Well, yes, the opposite then, if you can't think of that, which one would you leave behind for sure? Any Bradford pear that came my way. <laughs> okay. Cheat grass, Bradford pear. Um, easier to answer. Uh, Craig Myrtle. Um, I said, there's just so many good native plants that are just underappreciated. Amsonia is another one that's underappreciated, I think. I love swamp sunflower. Any other sunflowers are good. Is that the one you see that's about, I mean, that's blooming right now, it's yellow. It has the brown, brown Yeah, center. that's that one you, I think is, that's probably you're thinking of is just the annual sunflower, a common sunflower. Okay. The, the swamp sunflower, I have a thing for tall plants. I have one right now that the, I, there's a couple of stalks that are probably at least 15 feet tall. Wow. And whenever they bloom, they just kind of explode. And it's gonna be another three or four weeks before but they just, it's just jaw dropping, whatever they bloom. And yeah. what likes them? Um, the monarchs, if they're still around, love them. Any kind of butterfly, bees, everything's just covering them. They love them. And does it have seeds? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so bird, and I leave bird. those seeds on them and the birds come and get them. It's not kind of eat sunflower seeds that people They're eat. awfully little. <laughs> Different, different type of sunflower, I guess. Different types of sunflower, yes. I have seen sunflower fields full of sunflowers. Mm -hmm. I don't know what kind they are, but for the, in, in Oklahoma. Uh -huh. Yeah. And they're, they're with the big, with the big heads on. Yeah, those are ones that have been bred just for those big. But I think they're cool. Yeah. yeah. 
You have to have one of those on your island. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> For shade. You know, yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> well, we've covered a lot. Is there anything that, that we haven't, that I don't know to ask to, to mention? No? Mm -hmm. Maybe let me fit my list real quick. Don't take them fishing, do you? <laughs> I don't take those fishing. <laughs> and your customers are mostly probably middle-aged and up. You know, not necessarily. No, I've got. I'm, we're getting a lot of younger. Um, we did a show. Well, the Audubon tour is always is. Well, actually, I I, I see it going younger. Becoming more eco friendly, I guess. I think that's more it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Prius owners. Huh? Prius, Prius owners. owners, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, one big change, one big impact on the state is when there, I think, when it's whenever we had Doug Tallamy in, who wrote Bringing Nature Home. And we've brought him into Oklahoma twice now, and brought him to Oklahoma City and Tulsa to speak, and filled up. Both venues. I mean, like over 200 people at both, which is for Oklahoma, for a nature talk, is pretty good. And I, I will sound like a fanatic or something, but it really, I think, changed. I've heard enough people give me feedback and stuff about how it totally changed how they thought about plants and their yards and nature. He's He's a professor of entomology at the University of Delaware. One of the nicest guys you could ever meet. And um, the link that he draws between what we plant and what we see and the future of the earth is just, it's, it's just extremely powerful. He's just a little guy that just talks just real soft. But uh, I've seen after a talk, you know, people just sitting there and I go, you know, the whole room will be empty except for a few spread. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm just kind of in shock. Because it's that, how you know, it's that important of a message to him. People just, it's made a big difference in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. It's what, the attitude that people have towards plants. Time in I right see a difference. Africa. I see a difference in how people look at it. And how long ago was that? We brought him here like two years ago, I think was the last time we brought him here, for a year and a half. Have you ever had a chance to go here and talk? Yeah, I too, too. I mean, I think you would probably mesmerize the crowd too. Just no, he's, he that. is just, uh, he's just, he's amazing. And uh, yeah, he, he, he really had an impact, I think, on a lot of people. Had a huge impact on the Native Plant Society. I mean, we had so many young people join. That it's really seemed to change the makeup of things. Well, it seems to be different groups too between the bird, the bird people, and the and then the native plant people, and mm -hmm. it's just a mm -hmm. there's something that but links all, all of those. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. If you ever have a chance to go to the Audubon tour in Tulsa, do uh, that's always in late May every year, and they do five different houses, and there's different plant vendors at each house. That are all native plant vendors, and you get to see how different people have incorporated native plants and uh, bird-friendly yards. Uh, how they've incorporated that in their yard. Well, bird-friendly, not so much for the caterpillars and the butterflies, though. You just have to protect the ones you You know, <laughs> you know they all have to. It's a, it's that see, I don't mind webworms. Webworms are okay with me, so. It's that cycle of I just look at it as butterfly food. I mean, as bird food. So. Yeah, it's that cycle of life. It is. I have to keep, it is. keep telling myself that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, this has been great. Anything else you want to add before us? No. I, I always end my interviews with the questions, how do you want to be remembered? When history is written about you, what do you want it to say? Um, she said to be butterflies. <laughs> Uh, I just, I hope that maybe somewhere along the way, you know, you 
cause somebody to see something different. Maybe. Well, I, I thank you for making Oklahoma a little bit prettier. Oh, thank you. Yeah, and for helping the monarchs. Yeah. Then it's the right color. I wish you orange and black. <laughs> right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thank you.